The Scene Society by Eric Fromm. This is the second part of chapter 8. D. Interest and participation as motivation. If we consider separately the technical and the social aspects of the work situation, we find that many types of work would be attractive as far as the technical aspect is concerned, provided the social aspect were satisfactory. On the other hand, there are types of work where the technical aspect can, by its very nature, not be interesting, and yet where the social aspect of the work situation could make it meaningful and attractive. Starting with the discussion of the first instance, we find that there are many men who would, for example, take keen pleasure in being railroad engineers. But although railroad engineering is one of the highest paid and most respected positions in the working class, it is nevertheless not the fulfillment of the ambition of those who could do better. No doubt, many a business executive would find more pleasure in being a railroad engineer engineer than in his own work if the social context of the job were different. Let us take another example, that of a waiter in a restaurant. This job could be an exceedingly attractive one for many people, provided its social prestige were different. It, it, per it permits of constant interpersonal intercourse, and to people who like food, it gives pleasure to advise others about it, to serve it pleasantly, and so on. Many a man would find much more pleasure in working as a waiter than in sitting in his office over meaningless figures, were it not for the low social rating and low income of this job. Again, many others would love the job of a cab driver, were it not for its negative social and economic aspects. It is often said that there are certain types of work which nobody would want to perform unless forced to do so by economic necessity. The work of a miner is often given as an example. But considering the diversity of people and of their conscious and unconscious fantasies, it seems that there would be a considerable number of people for whom working within the earth and extracting its riches would have a great attraction were it not for the social and financial disadvantages of this type of work. There is hardly any kind of work which would not attract certain types of personalities, provided it were freed from the negative aspects, socially and economically. But even granted that the foregoing considerations are correct, it is undoubtedly true that much of the highly routinized work which is required by mechanized industry cannot in itself be a source of pleasure or satisfaction. Here again, the differentiation between the technical and the social aspect of the work proves to be important. While the technical aspect may indeed be uninteresting, the total work situation may offer a good deal of satisfaction. Here are some examples which serve to illustrate this point. Let us compare a housewife who takes care of the house and does the cooking with a maid who is paid for doing exactly the same work. Both for the housewife and the maid, the work in its technical aspects is the same, and it is not particularly interesting. Yet it will have an entirely different meaning and a satisfaction for the two, provided we think of a woman with a happy relationship to husband and children, and of an average maid who has no sentimental attach attachment to her employer. To the former, the work will not be drudgery, while to the latter it will be exactly that. And the only reason for doing it is that she needs the that money. Uh, she need the money. She oh, fuck. It is that she needs the money paid for it. The reason for this difference is obvious. While the work is the same in its technical aspects, the work situation is entirely different. For the housewife, it is part of her total relationship to her husband and children, and in this sense, her work is meaningful. The maid does not participate in the satisfaction of this social aspect of the work. Let us take another example. A Mexican Indian selling his goods on the market. The technical aspect of the work, that of waiting the whole day for customers and performing from time to time the transaction of answering questions as to price, etc., would be as boring and disagreeable as is the work of a sales girl, sales, sales girl in a 5 and 10 cent store. There is, however, one essential difference. For the Mexican Indian, the market situation is one of a rich and stimulating human intercourse. He responds with pleasure to his customers, is interested in talking with them, 
and would feel very frustrated if he had sold all his wares in the early morning and had no further occasion for this satisfaction in human relations. For the sales girl in the fine five and ten cent store, the situation is radically different. While she does not have to smile as much as a higher paid sales girl at a more fashionable store, her alienation from the customer is exactly the same. There is no genuine human intercourse. She operates as part of the sales machine, is afraid of being fired, and eager to make good. The work situation as a social situation is inhuman, empty, and deprived of any kind of satisfaction. It is true, of course, that the Indian sells his own product and reaps his own profit. But even a small independent shopkeeper will also be bored unless he transforms the social aspect of the work situation into a human one. Turning now to recent studies in the field of industrial psychology, we find a good deal of evidence for the significance of the differentiation between the technical and the social aspect of the work situation, and furthermore for the enlivening and stimulating effect of the active and responsible participation of the worker in his job. One of the most striking examples of the, fa of the fact that technically monotonous work can be interesting if the work situation as a whole permits of interest and active participation is the by now classic experiment carried out by Elton Maya Mayo at the Chicago Hawthorne Works of the Western Electric Company. The operation selected was that of assembling telephone coils, work which ranks as a repetitive performance and is usually performed by women. A standard assembly bench with the appropriate equipment and with places for five women workers was put into a room, which was separated by a partition from the main assembly room. Altogether, six operatives worked in this room, five working at the bench and one distributing parts to those engaged in the assembly. All of the women were experienced workers. Two of them dropped out within the first year, and their places were taken by two other workers of equal skill. Altogether, the experiment lasted for five years and was divided into various experimental periods in which certain changes were made in the conditions of work. Without going into the details of these changes, it suffices to state that rest pauses were adopted in the morning and afternoon, refreshments offered during these rest pauses, and the hours of work cut by half an hour. <coughs> Throughout these changes, the output of each worker rose considerably. So far, so good. Nothing was more plausible than the assumption that increased rest periods as some attempt to make the worker feel better were the cause for an increased efficiency. But a new arrangement in the 12th experimental period disappointed this expectation and showed rather dramatic results. By arrangement with the workers, the group returned to the conditions of work as they had existed in the beginning of the experiment. Rest periods, special refreshments, and other improvements were all abolished for approximately three months. To everybody's amazement, this did not result in a decrease of output, but on the contrary, the daily and weekly output rose to a higher point than at any time before. In the next period, the old concessions were introduced again, with the only exception that the girls provided their own food, while the company continued to supply coffee for the mid-morning lunch. The output still continued to rise, and not only the output, what is equally important is the fact that the rate of sickness among the workers in this experiment fell by about 80% in comparison with the general rate, and that a new social-friendly <clears throat> intercourse developed among the working women participating in the experiment. How can we explain the surprising result that the steady increase seemed to ignore the experimental changes in its upward development? If it was not the rest pauses, the tea, the shortened working time, what was it that made the workers produce more, be more healthy and more friendly among themselves? The answer is obvious. While the technical aspect of monotonous, uninteresting work remained the same, and while even certain improvements like rest pauses were not deci decisive, the social aspect of the total work situation had changed and caused change in the attitude of the workers. They were informed of the experiment and of the several steps in it, their suggestions were listened to and often followed, and what is perhaps the most important point, 
they were aware of participating in a meaningful and interesting experiment, which was important not only to themselves but to the workers of the whole factory. While they were at first shy and uneasy, silent, and perhaps somewhat suspicious of the company's intentions, later their attitude was marked by confidence and candor. The group developed a sense of participation in the work. Because they knew what they were doing, they had an aim and purpose, and they could influence the whole procedure by their suggestions. The startling results of Mayo's experiments show that sickness, fatigue, and a resulting low output are not caused primarily by the monotonous technical aspect of the work, but by the alienation of the worker from the total work situation and its social aspects. As soon as this alienation was decreased to a certain extent by having the worker participate in something that was meaningful to him and in which he had a voice, his whole psychological reaction to the work changed, although technically he was still doing the same kind of work. Mayo's Hawthorne experiment was followed by a number of research projects which tend to prove that the social aspect of the work situation has a decisive influence on the attitude of the worker. Even though the work process in its technical aspect remains the same. Thus, for instance, Wyatt and his associates provided clues as to other characteristics of the work situation which affect the will to work. These showed that variation in the rate of work in different individuals was dependent upon the prevailing group or social atmosphere, i.e., on a collective influence which formed an intangible background and determined the general nature of the reactions to the conditions of work. It is to the same point that in a smaller-sized working group, subjective satisfaction and output are higher than in larger working groups, although in the factories compared, the nature of the work process was almost identical, and physical conditions and welfare amenities were of a high order and much alike. The relationship between group size and morale have also been noted in a study by Hewitt and Parfit, conducted in a British textile plant. Um, Here, the non-sickness absent rate was found to be significantly greater among workers in a large-sized room than among those in smaller rooms accommodating fewer employees. An earlier study in the aircraft industry conducted during World War II by Mayo and Lombard arrives at very similar results. The social aspect of the work situation as against the purely technical one has been given special emphasis by G. Friedman. As one example of the difference between these two aspects, he describes the psychological climate which often develops among the men working together on a conveyor belt. Personal bonds and interests develop among the working team, and the work situation in its total aspect is much less monotonous than it would appear to the outsider who takes into account only the technical aspect. While the previous examples from research and industrial psychology show us the results of even a small degree of active participation within the framework of modern industrial organization, we arrive at insights which are much more convincing from the standpoint of the possibilities of the transformation of our industrial organization by turning to the reports on the communitarian movement one of the most significant and interesting movements in Europe today. There are around 100 communities of work in Europe, mainly in France, but also some in Belgium, Switzerland, and Holland. Some of them are industrial, and some of them are agricultural. They differ among themselves in various aspects. Nevertheless, the basic principles are sufficiently similar so that the description of one gives an adequate picture of the essential features of all. Boimondo is a watch case factory. Probably pronounced it wrong, though. In fact, it has become one of the seven largest such factories in France. It was founded by Marcel Barbou. He had to work hard in order to save money to have a factory of his own, where he introduced a factory council and a wage rating approved by all, including sharing in the profits. But this enlightened paternalism was not what Barbu was aiming at. After the French defeat in 1940, Barbu wanted to make a real start toward the liberation he had in mind. Since he could not find mechanics in Valence, he went out into the streets and found a barber, a sausage maker, a waiter. 
practically anyone except specialized industrial workers. The men were all under 30. He offered to teach them watch case making, provided they would agree to search with him for a setup in which the distinction between employer and employee would be abolished. The point was the search. The first and epoch-making discovery was that each worker would be free to tell the other off. At once, this complete freedom of speech between themselves and their employer created a buoyant atmosphere of confidence. It soon became evident, however, that telling each other off led to discussions and a waste of time on the job. So they unanimously set apart a time every week for an informal meeting to iron out differences and conflicts. But as they were not out just for a better economic setup, but a new way of living together, discussions were bound to lead to this to the disclosure of basic attitudes. Very soon, said Barbu, we saw the necessity of a common basis, or what we called from then on our common ethics. Unless there was a common ethical basis, there was no point to start from together, and therefore no possibility of building anything. To find a common ethical basis was not easy, because the two dozen workers now engaged were all different. Catholics, Protestants, materialists, humanists, atheists, communists, they all examined their own individual ethics, that is, not what they had been taught by rote, or what was conventionally accepted, but what they, out of their own experiences and thoughts, found necessary. They discovered that their individual ethics had certain points in common. They took those points and made them the common minimum on which they agreed unanimously. It was not a theoretical, vague declaration. In their foreword, they declared, There is no danger that our common ethical minimum should be an arbitrary convention, for in order to determine the points we rely on life experiences. All our moral principles have been tried in real life, everyday life, everybody's life. What they had rediscovered all by themselves and step by step was natural ethics, the Decalogue, which they expressed in their own words as follows. Thou, thou wilt love thy neighbor, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not take thy neighbor's goods, thou shalt not lie, thou wilt be faithful to thy promise, they shalt earn thy bread by the sweat of thy brow, thy, thy, thou shalt respect thy neighbor, his person, his liberty, thou shalt respect thyself, Thou shalt fight first against thyself, all vices which debase man, all the passions which hold man in slavery and are detrimental to social life, pride, avarice, lust, covetousness, gluttony, anger, laziness. Thou shalt hold that there are goods higher than life itself, liberty, human dignity, truth, and justice. The men pledge themselves to do their best, to practice their common ethical minimum in their everyday life. They pledged themselves to each other. Those who had more exacting private ethics pledged themselves to try to live what they believed, but recognized that they had absolutely no right to infringe on the liberties of others. In fact, they all agreed to respect fully the other's convictions or absence of convictions to the extent of never laughing at them or making jokes about it. The second discovery the group made was that they craved to educate themselves. They figured out that that the time they saved on production could be used for education. Within three months, the productivity of their work grew so much that they could save nine hours on a 48-hour week. What did they do? They used these nine hours for education and were paid for it as for regular work hours. First, they wanted to sing well together, then to polish their French grammar, then to learn how to read business accounts. From there, other courses developed, all given at the factory by the best instructors they could find. The instructors were paid the regular rates. There were courses in engineering, physics, literature, Marxism, Christianity, dancing, singing, and basketball. Their principle is, we do not start from the plant, from the technical activity of man, but from man himself. In a community of work, accent is not an acquiring together, but on working together for a collective and personal fulfillment. The aim is not increased productivity or higher wages, but a new style of life, which far from from relinquishing the advantages of the Industrial Revolution, is adapted to them. 
These are the principles on which this and other communities of work are built. One, in order to live a man's life, one has to enjoy the whole fruit of one's labor. Two, one has to be able to educate oneself. Three, one has to pursue a common endeavor within a professional group proportioned to the stature of man. 100 families maximum. Four, one has to be actively related to the whole world. When these, when these requisites were examined, one discovers that they amount to a shifting of the center of the problem of living, from making and acquiring things to discovering, fostering, and developing human relationships, from a civilization of objects to a civilization of persons, better even a civilization of movement between persons. As to payment, it corresponds to the achievement of the single worker, but it takes into account not only professional work, but also any human activity which had value for the group. A first-class mechanic who can play the violin, who is jolly and a good mixer, etc., has more value to the community than another mechanic equally capable professionally, but who is a sourpuss, a bachelor, etc. Oh. On an average, all workers earn between 10 and 20% more than they would with union wages, not counting all the special advantages. The community of work acquired a farm of 235 acres on which everybody, including the wives, work three periods of 10 days each year. As everybody has a month's vacation, it means that people work only 10 months a year at the factory. The idea behind it is not only the characteristic love of the Frenchman for the country, but also the conviction that no man should be entirely divorced from the soil. Most interesting is the solution they have found for a blend between centralization and decentralization, which avoids the danger of chaos and at the same time makes every member of the community an active and responsible participant in the life of the factory and of the community. We see here how the same kind of thought and observation which led to the formulation of the theories underlying the modern democratic state in the 18th and 19th centuries, division of powers, system of checks and balances, etc., was applied to the organization of an industrial enterprise. <clears throat> Ultimate power rests on the General Assembly, which meets twice a year. Only unanimous decisions bind the companions, members. The General Assembly elects a chief of community, unanimous vote only. The chief is not only the most qualified technically, as a manager should be, he is also the man who is an example, who educates, who loves, who is selfless, who serves. To obey a so-called chief without those qualities would be cowardice, cowardice. The chief has all executive power for three years. At the end of this period, he may find himself back at the machines. The chief has the right of veto against the General Assembly. If the General Assembly does not want to yield, a vote of confidence has to be taken. If confidence is not granted unanimously, the chief has the choice either to rally to the General Assembly's opinion or to resign. The General Assembly elects the members of the General Council. The General Council's task is to counsel the chief of community. Members are elected for one year. The General Council meets at least every four months. There are seven members plus the heads of departments. All decisions have to be taken unanimously. Within the General Council, section managers and eight members, including two wives, and the chief of community form the Council of Direction, which meets weekly. All responsible positions in the community, including section managers and foremen, are secured only through double trust appointment. That is, the person is proposed by one level and unanimously accepted by the other level. Usually, but not always, candidates are proposed by the higher level and accepted or rejected by the lower. This, say the members, prevents both demagogy and authoritarianism. All members meet once a week in an assembly <clears throat> of contact, which, as the name indicates, aims at keeping everybody abreast of what is happening in the community and also of keeping in touch with each other. A particularly important feature of the whole community are the neighbor groups, which meet periodically. A neighbor group is the smallest organism of the community. 
five or six families which do not live too far from each other, get together in the evening after supper under the guidance of a chief of neighbor groups, chosen according to the principle mentioned above. In a sense, the neighbor group is the most important unit in the community. It is leaven and lever. It is required to meet at one of the family's homes and at no other place. There, while drinking coffee, all the issues are thrashed out together. Minutes of the meeting are taken down and sent to the chief of community, who sums up the minutes of all the neighbor groups. Answers to their questions are then given by those who are in charge of the different departments. <coughs> in that way, neighbor groups not only ask questions, but voice discontent or make suggestions. It is also, of course, in the neighbor groups that people come to know each other best and help each other. Another feature of the community is the court. It is elected by the General Assembly and its function is to decide on conflicts which arise between two departments or between a department and a member. If the chief of the community cannot iron it out, the eight members of the court, unanimous votes as usual, do so. There is no set of laws and the verdict is based on and directed by the constitution of the community, the common ethic minimum and common sense. As Boimondo, there are two main sectors, or sorry, at Boimondo, there are two main sectors, the social and the industrial sector. The latter has the following structure. Men, maximum 10, form technical teams. Several teams form a section, a shop. Several sections form a service. Members of teams are responsible altogether toward the section, several sections toward the service. The social department deals with all activities other than technical ones. All members, including wives, are expected to carry on their spiritual, intellectual, artistic, and physical development. In that respect, reading the monthly review of Boimondo, Le Lien, is enlightening. Reports and commentaries on everything, football matches, competing with outside teams, photographic displays, visits to art exhibits, cooking recipes, ecumenical gatherings, reviews of musical, musical performances such as Lohengoth Quartet, appreciation of films, lectures on Marxism, basketball scores, discussion on conscientious objectors, accounts of days at the farm, reports on what America has to teach, passages from St. Thomas of Equinus regarding money, reviews of books such as Louis Bromfield's Pleasant Valley and Sartre's Dirty Hands, etc. A resilient spirit of goodwill, of goodwill permeates it all. Le Lien is a candid picture of people who have said yes to life, and this with a maximum of consciousness. There are 28 social sections, but new ones are constantly added. Teams listed according to numerical importance. One spiritual section, Catholic team, humanist team, materialist team, Protestant team. Two intellectual section, general knowledge team, civic instruction team, library team. Three artistic section, Theater team, singing team, interior decorating team, photo team. Four, communitarian life section, cooperative team, festivals and gatherings team, movie team, counter effort team. Five, mutual aid section, solidarity team, household maintenance team, bookbinding team. Six, family section, child care team, education team, social life team. Seven, health section. Two registered nurses, one practical nurse for general information, three visiting nurses, eight sports section, basketball team, men's basketball team, women's cross country team, football team, volleyball team, physical culture team, men's physical culture team, women, nine newspaper team, perhaps better than any definition, some statements of members of the community can give an idea of the spirit and practice of the community of work. A union member writes, I was shop delegate in 1936, arrested in 1940, and set, sent to Buchenwald. <coughs> Sorry. 
For 20 years, I have known many capitalist firms. And the community of work production <clears throat> is not the aim for living, but the means. I did not dare hope such large and complete results during my generation. A communist writes, As a member of the French Communist Party, and in order to avoid misunderstanding, I declare that I am entirely satisfied with my work and my communitarian life. My political opinions are respected, my complete liberty and my previous life ideal have become a reality. A materialist writes, As an atheist and a materialist, I consider that one of the most beautiful human values is tolerance and the respect of religious and philosophical opinions. For that reason, I feel particularly at home in our community of work. Not only is my freedom of thought and expression left intact, but I find in the community the material means and the time necessary to a deeper study of my philosophical conviction. A Catholic writes, I have been in the community for four years. I belong to the Catholic group. Like all Christians, I am trying to build a society in which the liberty and the dignity of the human being will be respected. I declare in the name of the whole Catholic group that the community of work is the type of society that a Christian can wish for. There, every man is free, respected, and everything inclines him to do better and to search for truth. If outwardly that society cannot be called Christian, it is Christian in fact. Christ gave us the sign through which it is possible to recognize his own, and we do love one another. A Protestant writes... We Protestants in the community declare that this revolution of society is the solution that enables every man freely to find his fulfillment in the way he has chosen, this without any conflict with his materialist or Catholic companions. The community composed of men who love one another fulfills our wishes to see men living in harmony together and knowing why they want to live. A humanist writes, I was 15 years old when I left school. I left the church at 11 after my first communion. I had gone a little ahead in my schooling, but the spiritual problem was gone out of my mind. I was like the great majority. I did not give a damn. At 22, I entered the community. At once, I found there was there an atmosphere of study and work life in no other place. First, I was attracted by the social side of the community, and it was only later that I understood that the human what the human value could be. Then I rediscovered that spiritual and moral side, which is in man and which I had lost at the age of 11. I belong to the humanist group because I do not see the problem like the Christians or the materialists do. I love our community because through it, all the deep aspirations which are in each of us can be awakened, met, and developed so that we may be transformed from individuals into men. The principles of other communities, whether they are agricultural or industrial, resemble resemble those of Boimondo. Here are some statements from the rule of the RG workshops, a community of work which manufactures picture frames, quoted by the author of All Things Common. Our community of work is not a new form of enterprise nor a reform in order to harmonize the relation capital-labor. It is a new mode of living in which man should find his fulfillment and in which all problems are solved in relation to the whole man. Thereby, it is in opposition to present-day society where solutions for the one or for the few are the usual concern. The consequence of bourgeois morality and capitalist system is a specialization of the activities of man to such a degree that man lives in moral misery, physical misery, intellectual misery, or material misery. Often in the working class, men suffer these four kinds of misery altogether, and under such conditions, it is a lie to speak of liberty, equality, fraternity. The aim of the community of work is to make possible the full development of man. Companions of RG declare that this is possible only within an atmosphere of liberty, equality, fraternity. But it should be acknowledged that, very often, Those three words bring nothing to our mind except the picture on currency or the inscriptions on front doors of public buildings. Liberty. A man is really free only under under three conditions. Economic freedom, intellectual freedom, moral freedom. Economic freedom. Man has an inalienable right to work. 
He has to have absolute right to the fruit of his work from which he should not part except freely. This conception is opposed to private property of collective means of production and to the reproducing of money by money, which makes possible the exploitation of man by man. We also declare that by work should be understood everything of value man brings to society. Intellectual freedom. A man is free only if he can choose. He can choose only if he knows enough to compare. Moral freedom. A man cannot be really free if he is enslaved by his passions. He can be free only if he has an ideal and a philosophical attitude which makes it possible for him to have a coherent activity in life. He cannot, under pretext of hastening his economic or intellectual liberation, use means contrary to the ethics of the community. Last, moral freedom does not mean license. It would be easy to demonstrate that moral freedom is to be, is to be found only within strict observance of the group ethics freely accepted. Fraternity. Man can blossom only in society. Selfishness is a dangerous and non lasting way of helping oneself. Man cannot separate his true interests from those of society. He can help himself only by helping society. He should become conscious that his own inclination makes him find an increase of joy with orders. Solidarity is not only a task, it is a satisfaction and the best guarantee of security. Fraternity leads to mutual tolerance and to the determination never to separate. This makes it possible to take all decisions unanimously on a common minimum. Equality. We condemn those who declare demagogically that all men are equal. We can see that men are not equal in value. For us, equality of rights means to put at the disposal of everyone the means to fulfill oneself completely. Thereby, we substitute a hierarchy of personal value for the conventional or hereditary hierarchy. Summing up the most remarkable points in the principles of these communities, I want to mention the following. One, the communities of work do make use of all modern industrial techniques and avoid the tendency of going back to handicraft pro- uh, production. Two, they have devised a scheme in which active participation of everyone does not contradict a sufficiently centralized leadership. A rational authority has been replaced by rational authority. Three, the emphasis on the practice of life as against ideological differences. This emphasis enables men of the most varied and contradictory convictions to live together in brotherliness and tolerance, without any danger of having to follow the right opinion proclaimed by the community. By the community. Four, the integration of work, social, and cultural activities. And as much as the work is not attractive technically, it is meaningful and attractive in its social aspect. Activity in the arts and sciences is an integral part of the total situation. Five. The situation of alienation is overcome. Work has become a meaningful expression of human energy. Human solidarity is established without restriction of freedom or the danger of conformity. While many of the arrangements and principles of the communities can be questioned and argued about, it seems nevertheless that we have here one of the most convincing empirical examples of a productive life and of possibilities which are generally looked upon as fantastic from the standpoint of our present day life in capitalism. The communities described so far are, of course, not the only examples for the possibility of communitarian life. Whether we take Owen's communities or those of the Mennonites or Hutterites or the agricultural settlements in the state of Israel, they all contribute to our knowledge of the possibilities of a new style of life. They also show that most of these communitarian experiments are executed by men with a shrewd intelligence and an immensely practical sense. They are by no means the dreamers our so-called realists believe them to be. (coughs) On the contrary... They are mostly more realistic and imaginative than our conventional business leaders appear to be. Undoubtedly, there have been many shortcomings in the principles and practice of these experiments which must be recognized in order to be avoided. Undoubtedly, 
Undoubtedly also, the 19th century, with its unshakable belief in the wholesome effect of industrial competitive, competitiveness, was less conducive to the success of these colonies than the second half of the 20th century will be. But the glib condescension implying the futility and lack of realism of all these experiments is not any more reasonable than what was the first popular reaction to the possibilities of railroad and later of airplane travel. It is, it is essentially a symptom of the laziness of the mind and the inherent conviction that what has not been cannot be and will not be. E. Practical Suggestions the question is whether conditions similar to those created by the communitarians could be created for the whole of our society. The aim then would be to create a work situation in which man gives his lifetime and energy to something which has meaning for him, in which he knows what he is doing, has an influence on what is being done, and feels united with rather than separated from his fellow man. This implies that the work situation is made concrete again, that the workers are organized in into sufficiently small groups to enable the individual to relate himself to the group as real, concrete human beings, even though the factory as a whole may have many thousands of workers. It means that methods of blending centralization and decentralization are found which permit active participation and responsibility for everybody, and at the same time create a unified leadership as far as it is necessary. How can this be done? The first condition for an active participation of the worker is that he is well informed, not only about his own work, but about the performance of the whole enterprise. Such knowledge, such knowledge is, for one thing, technical knowledge of the work process. A worker may have to make only a specific move on the conveyor belt, and it may be sufficient for his performance if he is trained on the job for two days or two weeks, but his whole attitude toward his work would be different if it if he had a wider knowledge of all the technical problems involved in the production of the whole product. Such technical knowledge can be acquired in the first place by attendance at an industrial school, simultaneously with his first years of work in a factory. Furthermore, they can be acquired continuously by participating in technical and scientific courses given to all the workers of the factory, even at the expense of time taken from the job. If the technical process employed in the factory is an object of interest and knowledge to the worker, if his own thinking process is stimulated by such knowledge, even the otherwise monotonous technical work he has to perform will assume a different aspect. Aside from technical knowledge about the industrial process, another knowledge is necessary, that of the economic function of the enterprise he is working for and its relationship to the economic needs and problems of the community as a whole. Again, by schooling during the first years of his work and by constant information given to him about the economic processes involved in his enterprise, the worker can acquire real knowledge of its function within the national and world economy. However important, technically and economically, this knowledge of the work process and the functioning of the whole enterprise is, it is not enough. Theoretical knowledge and interest stagnate if there is no way of translating them into action. The worker can become an active, interested, and responsible participant only if he can have influence on the decisions which bear upon his individual work, situation, and the whole enterprise. His alienation from work can be overcome only if he is not employed by capital, if he is not the object of command, but if he becomes a responsible subject who employs capital. The principal point here is not ownership of the means of production, but participation in management and decision making. As in the political sphere, the problem here is to avoid the danger of an anarchic state of affairs in which central planning and leadership would be lacking, but the alternative between centralized authoritarian management and planless, uncoordinated workers' management is not a necessary one. The answer lies in a blending of centralization and decentralization, in a synthesis between decision-making flowing from above to below and from below to above. The principle of co-management and workers' participation can be worked out in such a way 
that the responsibility for management is divided between the central leadership and the rank and file. Well-informed small groups discuss matters of their own work situation and of the whole enterprise. Their decisions would be channeled to the management and form the basis for a real co-management. As a third participant, the consumer would have to participate in the decision-making and planning in some form. Once we accept the principle that the primary purpose of any work is to serve people and not to make a profit, those who are served must have a say in the operation of those who serve them. Again, as in the case of political decentralization, it is not easy to find such forms, but certainly it is not an insurmountable problem provided the general principle of co-management is accepted. In constitutional law, we have solved similar problems with regard to the respective rights of various branches of government. And in the laws concerning corporations, we have solved the same problem with regard to the right of various types of stockholders, management, etc. The principle of co-management and co-determination means a serious restriction of property rights. The owner or owners of an enterprise would be entitled to a reasonable rate of interest on their capital investment, but not to the unrestricted command over men whom this capital can hire. They would have at least to share this right with those who work in the enterprise. In fact, as far as the big corporations are concerned, the stockholders do not really exercise their property rights by making decisions. If the workers share the right to make decisions with the management, the factual role of the stockholders would not be fundamentally different. A law introducing co-management would be a restriction of property rights, but by no means any revolutionary change in such rights. Even as industrialist as conservative as the protagonist of profit-sharing in industry, J.F. Lincoln proposes, as we have seen, that the dividends should not exceed a relatively fixed and constant amount, and that the profit exceeding this amount should be divided among the workers. There are possibilities for workers' co-management and control even on the basis of present-day conditions. B.F. Fairless, for instance, the chairman of the board of the United States Steel Corporation, said in a recent address published in a condensed form in the Reader's Digest, November 15, 1953, page 17, that the 300,000 employees of United States Steel could buy all the common stock of the corporation by purchasing 87 shares apiece, at a total cost of $3,500. By investing $10 per week apiece, which is about what our steelworkers gained in the recent wage increase, the employees of U.S. Steel could buy all of the outstanding common stock in less than seven years. Actually, they would not even have to purchase that much, but only part of it in order to have enough of the stock to give them a voting majority. Another proposal has been made by F. Tenenbaum, in his philosophy of labor. He suggests that the unions could buy sufficient shares of the enterprises whose workers they represent to control the management of these enterprises. Whatever the method employed is, it is an evolutionary one, only continuing trends and property relations which already exist. And they are means to an end and only means to make it possible that men work for a meaningful aim in a meaningful way and are not bearers of a commodity physical energy and skill, which is bought and sold like any other commodity. In discussing workers' participation, one important point must be stressed. The danger, namely, that such participation could develop in the direction of the profit-sharing concepts of the supercapitalist type. If the workers and employees of an enterprise were exclusively concerned with their enterprise, the alienation between man and his social forces would remain unchanged. The egotistical, alienated attitude would only have been extended from one individual to the team. It is therefore not an incidental, but an essential part of workers' participation that they look beyond their own enterprise, that they be interested in and connected with consumers, as well as with other workers in the same industry, and with the working population as a whole. The development of a kind of local patriotism for the firm, of an esprit de corps similar to that of college and university students, as recommended by Wyatt and other British social psychologists, 
but it only reinforced the asocial and egotistical attitude, which is the essence of alienation. All such suggestions in favor of team enthusiasm ignore the fact that there is only one truly social orientation, namely the one of solidarity with mankind. Social cohesion within the group combined with antagonism to the outside outsider is not social feeling, but extended egotism. Concluding these remarks on workers' participation, I want to stress again, even at the risk of being re repetitious, that all suggestions in the direction of the humanization of work do not have the aim of increasing economic output, nor is their goal a greater satisfaction with work per se. They make sense only in a totally different social structure in which economic activity is a part and a subordinate part of social life. One cannot separate work activity from political activity, from the use of leisure time and from personal life. If work were to become interesting without the other spheres of life becoming human, no real change would occur. In fact, it could not become interesting. It is the very evil of present-day culture that it separates and compartmentalizes the various spheres of living. The way to sanity lies in overcoming this split and in arriving at a new unification and integration within society and within the individual human being. I have spoken before of the discouragement among many socialists with the results of applied socialism. But there is a growing awareness that the fault was not with the basic aim of socialism, an unalienated society in which every working person participates actively and responsibly in industry and in politics, but with the wrong emphasis on private versus communal property and the neglect of the human and properly social factors. There is, correspondingly, a growing insight into the necessity for a socialist vision which is centered around the idea of workers' participation and co-management on decentralization and on the concrete function of man in the working process, rather than on the abstract concept of property. The ideas of Owen, Fourier, Kropotkin, Lundauer, of religious and secular commun communitarians become fused with those of Marx and Engels. One becomes skeptical of purely ideological formulations of the final aims and more concerned with the concrete person, with the here and now. There is hope that there may be also growing awareness among democratic and humanist socialists that socialism begins at home. That is to say, with the socialization of the socialist parties. Socialism is meant here, of course, not in terms of property rights, but in terms of responsible participation of each member. As long as the socialist parties do not realize the principle of socialism within their own ranks, they cannot expect to convince others. Their representatives would, if they had political power, execute their ideas in the spirit of capitalism, regardless of the socialist labels they used. The same holds true for trade unions, in as much as their aim is industrial democracy, they must introduce the principle of democracy in their own organizations, rather than run them as any other big business is run in capitalism, or sometimes even worse. The influence of this communitarian emphasis on the concrete situation of the worker in his work process was quite powerful in the past among Spanish and French anarchists and syndicalists and among the Russian social revolutionaries. Although the importance of these ideas had been receding in most countries for some time, it seems that they are slowly gaining ground again in less ideological and dogmatic and hence more real and concrete forms. In one of the most interesting recent publications on the problems of socialism, the new Fabian Essays, one can detect this growing emphasis on the functional and human aspect of socialism. C.A.R. Crossland writes in his essay on the transition from capitalism, socialism requires that this hostility in industry should give way to a feeling of participation and a joint endeavor. How is this to be achieved? The most direct and easily exploitable line of advance is in the direction of joint consultation. Much fruitful work has been done in this sphere, and it is now clear that something more is needed than joint production committees on the present model. Some more radical effort to give the worker a sense of participation in the making of decisions. A few progressive firms have already made bold advances, and the results are encouraging. 
He suggests three measures, large-scale extension of nationalization, statutory dividend limitation, or a third possibility is to alter the legal structure of company ownership as to substitute for shareholders sole control, a constitution which explicitly defines the responsibilities of the firm to worker, consumer, and community. Workers will become members of the company and have their representatives on the board of directors. R. Jenkins, in his paper on equality, sees as the issue of the future, in the first place, whether the capitalists, having surrendered or had taken from them so much of their power, and therefore of their functions, should be allowed to retain the quite substantial portion of their privileges, which still remain to them, and in the second place, whether the society which is growing out of capitalism is to be a participant democratic socialist society, or whether it is to be a managerial society, controlled by a privileged elite, enjoying a standard of living substantially different from that of the mass of the population. Jenkins came to the conclusion that a participant democratic socialist society requires that the ownership of enterprises when it passes from wealthy individuals should go not to the state, but to less remote public bodies and should permit greater diffusion of power and encourage people of all sorts to play a more active part in the work and control of public and voluntary organizations. A. Albu in The Organization of Industry states, However successful the nationalization of basic industries has been in technical and economic terms, it has not satisfied the desire for a wider and more democratic distribution of authority, nor built up any real measure of participation by those engaged in them, in, a man in managerial decisions and their execution. This has been a disappointment to many socialists who never wished for a great concentration of state power, but who had none but the most hazy and utopian ideas of any alternatives. The lessons of totalitarianism abroad and the growth of the managerial revolution at home have underlined their anxiety, all the more so as full employment in a society which remains democratic is seen to create problems which need for their solution the widest possible popular sanction based on information and consultation. Consultation is the less successful the further it recedes from face-to-face -face discussion on the job and the size and structure of industrial units and the degree to which they can exercise independent initiative are therefore seen as matters of supreme importance. What is finally required, says Albu, is a cons consulted consultative system which will provide sanction for policy decisions and for an executive authority willingly accepted by all the members of an industry. How to reconcile this conception of industrial democracy with the more primitive desire for self-government which activated the syndicalists and which underlies so much current discussion on joint consultation is a matter on which much research needs still to be done. It would seem, however, that there must exist some process by which all those employed in an industry are enabled to participate in policy decisions, either through directly elected representatives on the board or through a hierarchical system of joint consultation with considerable powers. In either case, there must also be an increasing participation in the process of interpreting policy and of making decisions at subordinate levels. The creation of a feeling of common purpose in the activities of an industry still remains, therefore, one of the outstanding, unattained objectives of socialist industrial policy. John Strachey, who is the most optimistic and perhaps the most satisfied with, with the result of the Labour government amongst the writers in the new Fabian essays, agrees with Albu's emphasis on the necessity of workers' participation. After all, Strachey writes in Tasks and Achievement of British Labour, what is the matter with the joint stock company is the irresponsible dictatorship exercised over it, nominally by its shareholders, actually in many cases by one or two self-appointing and self-perpetuating directors. Make public companies directly responsible both to the community and to the whole body of those engaged in their activities, and they would become institutions of a very different kind. I have quoted the voices of some of the British labour leaders because their views are the result of a good deal of practical experience with the socialization measures of the Labour government and of a thoughtful criticism of these accomplishments. 
but also continental socialists have paid more and more attention to workers' participation in industry than ever before. In France and Germany after the war, laws were adopted which provided for workers' participation in the management of enterprises, even though the results of these new provisions were far from satisfactory. The reasons being the half-heartedness of the measures and the fact that in Germany, union representatives were transformed into managers rather than that the workers at the factory themselves participated. It is nevertheless clear that there is a growing insight among socialists into the fact that the transfer of property rights from the private capitalist to society or the state has in itself only a negligible effect on the situation of the worker and that the central problem of socialism lies in the chance of the work situation. Even in the rather weak and confused declarations of the newly formed Socialist International in Frankfurt, emphasis is put on the necessity of decentralizing economic power. Wherever this is compatible with the aims of planning among scientific observers, or sorry, of planning, period. <clears throat> among scientific observers of the industrial scene, it is especially Friedman, it is to some extent Gillespie who arrive at conclusions similar to my own concerning the transformation of work. <coughs> <clears throat> Emphasizing the necessity for co-management rather than centering plans for communitarian transformation on the change of property rights does not mean that a certain degree of direct state intervention and socialization are not necessary. The most important problem, aside from co-management, lies in the fact that our whole industry is built upon the existence of an ever-widening inner, inner market. Each enterprise wants to sell more and more in order to conquer an ever-widening share of the market. The result of this economic situation is that industry uses all means within its power to whet the buying appetite of the population, to create and reinforce the receptive orientation which is so detrimental to mental sanity <clears throat> As we have seen, this means that there is a craving for new but unnecessary things, a constant wish to buy more, even though from the standpoint of human unalienated use, there is no need for the new product. The automobile industry, for instance, spent some billion dollars on the changes for the new 1955 models, Chevrolet alone some hundred million dollars to compete with Ford. Without doubt, the older Chevrolet was a good car and the fight between Ford and General Motors, has not primarily the effect of giving the, the public a better car, but of making them buy a new car when the old one would have done for another few years. Another aspect of the same phenomenon is the tendency to waste, which is furthered by the economic need for increasing mass production. Aside from the economic loss implied in this waste, it has also an important psychological effect. It makes the consumer lose respect for work and human effort. It makes him forget the needs of people within his own and in poorer lands, for whom the product he wastes could be a most valuable possession. In short, our habits of waste show a childish disregard for the realities of human life, for the economic struggle for existence, which nobody can evade. It is quite obvious that in the long run, no amount of spiritual influence can be successful if our economic system is organized in such a way that a crisis threatens when people do not want to buy more and more, newer and better things. Hence, if our aim is to change alienated into human consumption, changes are necessary in those economic processes which produce alienated consumption. It is the task of economists to devise such measures Generally speaking, it means to direct production into fields where existing real needs have not yet been satisfied, rather than where needs must be created artificially. This can be done by means of credits through state-owned banks, by the socialization of certain enterprises, and by drastic laws which accomplish a transformation of advertising. Closely related to this problem is that of economic help from the industrialized societies, to the economically less developed part of the world. It is quite clear that the time of colonial exploitation is over, that the various parts of the world have been brought together as closely as one continent was a hundred years ago, and that peace for the wealthier part of the world is dependent on the economic advancement of the poorer part. 
Peace and liberty in the Western world cannot in the long run coexist with hunger and sickness in Africa and China. Reduction of unnecessary consumption in the industrialized countries is a must if they want to help the non-industrialized countries, and they must want to help them if they want peace. Let us consider a few facts according to H. Brown, a world development program covering 50 years would increase agricultural production to the point where all persons would receive adequate nutrition and would lead to an industrialization of the now undeveloped areas similar to the pre-war level of Japan. The yearly outlay for the United States for such a program would be between four and five billion dollars each year for the first 30 years and afterwards less. When we compare this to our national income, says the author, to our present federal budget, to the funds required for armament, and to the cost of waging war, the amount required does not appear to be excessive. When we compare it to the potential gains that can result from a successful program, it appears even smaller. And when we compare the cost with that of inaction and to the consequences of maintaining the status quo, it is indeed insignificant. The foregoing problem is only part of the more general problem as to what extent the interests of profitable capital investment may be permitted to manipulate the public needs in a detrimental and unhealthy way. The most obvious examples are our movie industry, the comic book industry, and the crime pages of our newspapers. In order to make the highest profit, the lowest instincts are artificially stimulated and the mind of the public is poisoned. The Food and Drug Act has regulated the unrestricted production and advertising of harmful food and drugs. The same can be done with regard to all other vital necessities. If such laws should prove to be ineffective, certain industries, such as the film industry, must be socialized, or at least competing industries must be created, financed with public funds. In a society in which the only aim is the development of man and in which material needs are subordinated to spiritual needs, it will not be difficult to find legal and economic means to ensure the necessary changes. As far as the economic situation of the individual citizen is concerned, the idea of equality of income has never been a socialist demand and is for many reasons neither practical nor even desirable. What is necessary is an income which will be the basis for a dignified human existence. As far as inequalities of income are concerned, it seems that they must not transcend the point where differences in income lead to differences in the experience of life. The man with an income of millions who can satisfy any whim without even thinking about it experiences life in a different way from the man who, to satisfy one costly wish, has to sacrifice another. The man who can never travel beyond his town, who can never afford any luxury, that is to say something that is not necessary, again has a different life experience from his neighbor who can do so. But even within certain differences of income, the basic experience of life can remain the same, provided the income difference does not exceed a certain uh, margin. What matters is not so much the greater or lesser income as such, but the point where quant quantitative differences of income are transformed into a qualitative difference of life experience. Needless to say, the system of social security as it exists now in Great Britain, for instance, must be retained. But this is not enough. The existing social security system must be extended to a universal subsistence guarantee. <clears throat> Each individual can act as a free and responsible agent only if one of the main reasons for present-day unfreedom is abolished. The economic threat of starvation which forces people to accept working conditions which they would otherwise not accept. There will be no freedom as long as the owner of capital can enforce his will on the man who owns only his life. Because the latter, being without capital, has no work except what the capitalist offers him. A hundred years ago, it was a widely accepted belief that no one had the responsibility for his neighbor. It was assumed and scientifically proved by economists that the laws of society made it necessary to have a vast army of poor and jobless people in order to keep the economy going. Today, hardly anybody would dare to voice this principle any longer. It is generally accepted that nobody should be excluded from the wealth of the notion of the nation, either by the laws of nature or by those of society.
The rationalizations which were current a hundred years ago, that the poor owed their condition to their ignorance, lack of responsibility, briefly to their sins, are outdated. In all Western industrialized countries, a system of insurance has been introduced, which guarantees everyone a minimum for subsistence in case of unemployment, sickness, and old age. It is only one step further to postulate that, even if these conditions are not present, everyone has a right to receive the means to subsist. Practically speaking, that would mean that every citizen can claim a sum, enough for the minimum of subsistence even though he is not unemployed, sick, or aged. He can demand this sum if he has quit his job voluntarily, if he wants to prepare himself for another type of work, or for any personal reason which prevents him from earning money, without falling under one of the categories of the existing insurance benefits. Shortly, he can claim this subsistence minimum without having to have any reason. It should be limited to a definite time period, let us say two years, so as to avoid the fostering of a neurotic attitude which refuses any kind of social obligation. This may sound like a fantastic proposal, but so would our insurance system have sounded to people a hundred years ago. The main objection to such a scheme would be that if each person were entitled to receive minimum support, people would not work. This assumption rests upon the fallacy of the inherent laziness in human nature. Actually, aside from neurotically lazy people, there would be very few who would not want to earn more than the minimum, and who would prefer to do nothing rather than to work. However, the suspicions against a system of guaranteed subsistence minimum are not unfounded from the standpoint of those who want to use ownership of capital for the purpose of forcing others to accept the work conditions they offer. If nobody were forced anymore to accept work in order not to starve, don't do that, sorry, um, in order not to starve, work would have to be sufficiently interesting and attractive to induce one to accept it. Freedom of contract is possible only if both parties are free to accept and reject it, in the present capitalist system, this is not the case. But such a system would be not only the beginning of real freedom of contract between employers and employees, it would also enhance tremendously the sphere of freedom in interpersonal relationships between person and person in daily life. Let us look at some examples. A person who is employed today and dislikes his job is often forced to continue in it because he does not have the means to risk unemployment, even for one or two months. And naturally, if he quits the job, he has no right to unemployment benefits. But actually, the psychological effects of this situation go much deeper. The very fact that he cannot risk being fired tends to make him afraid of his boss or whomever he is dependent on. He will be inhibited in answering back. He will try to please and to submit because of the constantly present fear that the boss could fire him if he asserted himself. Or let us take the man who at the age of 40 decides that he wants an entirely different kind of job for which it will take one or two years to prepare himself. Since under the conditions of a guaranteed existence minimum, a guaranteed existence minimum, this decision would imply having to live with a minimum of comfort. It would require great enthusiasm for an interest in his newly chosen field. And thus only those who were gifted and really interested would make the choice. Or let us take a woman living in an unhappy marriage whose only reason for not leaving her husband is the inability to support herself even for the time necessary to be trained for a job. Or let us think of an adolescent living in severe conflicts with a neurotic or destructive father whose mental health would be saved if he were free to leave his family. Briefly, the most fundamental coercion on economic grounds in business and private relations would be removed and the freedom to act would be restored to everybody. <clears throat> What about costs? Since we already have adopted the principle for the unemployed, the sick, and the aged, there would only be a marginal group of additional people who would make use of this privilege. The ones who are particularly gifted, those who find themselves in a temporary conflict, and the neurotic ones who have no sense of responsibility or interest in work. Considering all factors involved, it would seem that the number of people using this privilege would not be extraordinarily high and by careful research, an approximate estimate could even be made today. But it must be emphasized that this proposal is to be taken together with the other social changes 
suggested here, and that in a society in which the individual citizen actively participates in his work, the number of people not interested in work would only be a fraction of what it is under present-day conditions. Whatever their number, it seems that the cost for such a scheme would hardly be more than what big states have spent for the maintenance of armies in the last decades, not taking into consideration the cost of armaments. It should also not be forgotten that in a system which restores interest in life and in work to everybody, the productivity of the individual worker would be far above that reported today as a result of even a few favorable changes in the work situation. In addition, our expenses due to criminality, neurotic or psychosomatic illness would be considerably less.